And this month's Where Did the Road Go is sponsored by Super Inframan, Allison Cook, and Eric Hervin. Thank you all so very much for your incredible support. Transmission start. Welcome to Where Did the Road Go? Join us as we wander off the path and explore lost history, consciousness, the paranormal, unexplained mysteries, alternative thought, and much more. We are present on the web at wheredidtheroadgo.com. Now here is your host, Soraya. Welcome to this edition of Where Did the Road Go? And tonight I have, well, sort of a, it becomes sort of a round table here. You want to introduce yourselves and your podcast? Sure. I'm Barbara Fisher. Uh, Morgana Marks. Kendra Mauer. And the three of us are on the Six Degrees of John Keel podcast, where we talk about our experiences, other people's experiences, and everything in between. Pretty much whatever we want, and we usually take a hard left turn into something that we weren't intending to talk about, but it ends up fun anyway, so we just go with it. Well, that works here, because that's what we do. Hence, where did the road go? (laughs) Um, and you started this podcast, was it the end of last year? I think we started in September. Yeah. Was okay. that our first episode? I think it was. And we were every two weeks for the end of 2020. And then starting in 2021, we went to weekly. Okay. And uh, why the name Six Degrees of John Keel? Which is how I found you. I mean, I, that name popped up and I went, Oh, yeah, putting that one on my list. <laughs> Excellent. Good. Um, it, it came about because John Keel said in the opening of Mothman that within 100 miles of you, wherever you are, someone has seen a monster. And within that same radius, someone else has seen a UFO. And another person has seen a ghost and it might be your cousin. And, you know, you never know next week you might be driving down the road and you're going to see something. And I said, you know, that's, that's really great. That's like six degrees of Kevin Bacon, but weird, (laughs) you know? And, and basically what his point was is even if you've never seen something, someone, you know, has experienced something weird. Right. And that's been my experience, like, as a person, like, not just as somebody who's seen weird things, but, I mean, I have never been in a group of more than three people, and, like, if ghosts or some other paranormal thing gets brought up, somebody invariably is like, you know, I saw a blank once, Mm -hmm. or my brother did. Or something. And it really is just the whole world, sometimes it seems like, is just however many deg- six degrees away from high strangeness. I'm, I'm always amused at the people where they start out and they'll be like, I don't really believe in that stuff. But there was that one time. That's right. exactly what I always find in most circles is you'll start to tell a story and they'll say, I don't believe in that stuff. But I have a story. And you're yeah. like, oh, here we go. And sometimes they're reluctant, like, but eventually they'll be like, I mean, there there was this one time and I don't know what it was. Yeah. Yeah. Especially if you kind of start the story and let them know that you're, you're a, you're a willing audience. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, what, what types of experiences have all of you had? Like a shared experience we've all had or just just, just, each one of us? Each one of you we could start (laughs) with. Did you all grow up around the same area? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> no. Um, I grew up in Charleston, West Virginia, and Kendra. I grew up in mostly in Cincinnati, but I also lived in New Orleans as a child. Oh, okay. Yes. Um, I grew up half in Charleston and half in Athens, Ohio. Okay. All right. But you, you, you've been friends a long time. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I hope so. She's my mom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, we we do get along. Um, Kendra and I met in Athens, Ohio. So the yeah. one thing that the three of us have in common is Athens, Ohio. Mm. 
And Athens is a kind of pretty strange place. Yeah, you've done a couple of shows on that. Yeah, and we have more coming, so. Yeah. Okay, so in, individually, what kind of, because I know you've all had different types of experiences. My, I'll go first. Mine, <laughs> mine have mostly been um, ghosts and, and that kind of um, more of a spiritual nature. And I've also, I also saw Mothman. And it took me a very long time to actually come out and say, I saw this because it's kind of wacky sounding. But once I, I saw a TV show about it, and I realized that I wasn't the only one, and that is actually what I saw. Because I, like, I saw it, it freaked me out, I kind of shut down about it, and then just ignored it for a very long time. Yeah, now, now when you say you saw Mothman, what exactly did you see? I saw, so I was going around a curve, it basically is a, a Y in the road, and it was, it was at night, I was a, th- a friend of mine, and it was like a three-dimensional shadow with eyes that were glowing. And it, the thing was huge. It, it obscured one of those diamond, yellow diamond road signs. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and it's like you, you see it and you feel it at the same time. Like there's no definite, I saw it and it freaked me out. It's just, you feel this, it's like being in a nightmare and trying to scream and you can't get the breath to do it. That's how it feels. Where you're, you're fight. It's it's a night terror, actually. The more I think about it, I'm like, this is a, this is like a, a night terror, but you're awake, <laughs> and someone is driving the car and having to manage a large piece of machinery while they're having this experience. Um, I was not driving, thankfully. I don't. I would have hit the sign and dumped in the swamp. <laughs> um, he took the curve at full speed, um, but that's it. It was darker than night, and it was, it, it was big. <laughs> now, now, why, why do you say it was Mothman rather than like a shadow person? I honestly, that is a good question. I've, I've never thought of that one. Um, honestly, because watching the Sci-Fi Channel, they did a rendition of Mothman when they did an episode on it, or they did a show. I forget, it was, I forget what show it was part of, but. The mock-up that they did, the size, the shape, and specifically the eyes are mm. what got my attention. And that actually, when I saw that, I my knees went out from under me. I just sat down on the coffee table. And this, this was, if I remember right, this was something you didn't talk about for a while. Right. It was a good 20 years before I spoke about it. 15, 20 years. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, she wouldn't even tell me. Yeah. I, I just... It, I guess, I don't know if I compartmentalized it, but it was just, it was so far outside of anything that should have been mm-hmm. that I think I just made it not. <laughs> <laughs> um, the person who was driving, what, were, what was their experience? Was it the same as yours? Yeah, he saw the same thing, and because I, as we're going, I remember at one point I was saying his name over, all I could say was his name. And he had been talking, and then I realized he had stopped talking, and he goes, yeah, I see it. And that's all he got out before he finally, like, we were both just entranced. Mm-hmm. But, you know, he saw it and took the curve. We went off. He was dropping me out off at the civilian conservation camp where I worked. And uh, we just kind of sat in the parking lot for a good long time and just were quiet. And And then it was eventually, did you see that? He's like... Yeah, I saw that. And he had a little pen light with the uh, uh, red on it, the red film on it. And he goes, eyes were like this? I'm like, uh-huh. And then he goes, we are never speaking of this again. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm good with that. And he took a different way home because <laughs> I, I don't think he ever drove that road again. I was reluctant to. I eventually did, but I was reluctant to. Huh. He, uh... He told me about it later. It was years later, but it was before Kendra told me. Yeah. Um, and what he said was, I don't know what I saw, but it was big and it was black and the eyes were huge and red. Yeah. And I said, was it? And I, 
I put my lips together to make the M sound, and he shook his head. He said, I'm not going to say it. I don't want to know. I don't want to yeah. think about it. Yeah. So he knew what I was going to say. And, and I, I was think, like, okay. <laughs> I think for both of us, we did, it was, if you think it, it will show up again. And mm. we did want, we wanted to do nothing that would encourage that back into our lives. I've gone back to that area since then. In fact, we spent, <laughs> We spent Mother's Day weekend walking around that area, showing my kids all the things that scared the poop out of me as a as a twenty something. <laughs> but um, it just it didn't you know there was no residual anything. It was just a nice walk right. along the the old train tracks because it's on a old rail bed that I saw it. Hmm. And uh, when you say it was black, would you? The things I've seen like that have always appeared to me like liquid darkness. Would that fit the description? It, yes. I, it, it's almost, it's like it would drink in light. Like nothing yeah. reflected off of it. It's like, it's like a negative. Everything just sunk into it and nothing came out except light from its eyes. Hmm. And they were very definitely, they were luminous. They were not reflectors. Because that's when a lot of people will ask is, you know, what could it have been a reflection? And yeah. <laughs> there's no way. And it definitely was not eye shine because it didn't have that shimmer. Right. It was just right. red. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, that, that's, that's an incredible experience. It really is. Was, yeah. <laughs> was anything like changing in your life around then? I was 25 years old and off to see the world. So I was in a place of absolute transition through that period of my life. Mm. Um, as far as my, ex did I change with what I could experience? I think I developed some, a level of empathy I hadn't had before where I can, like you can walk into a room and get a sense of what's going on. I'm trying to figure out how to describe it. Like there's some people that I can, I call it linking where it's like, I can experience what they're experiencing from a distance. Right. Sort, um, of, sort of a distant I've, empathy sort of thing. Yeah. And it, it's, it's, it can be uncomfortable because sometimes it's people that I don't want to experience that with, but for whatever reason, there I am. And I'm like, great. <laughs> it had to be you. <laughs> um, other people, it's not so bad. It's, you know, like Barbara and Morgana, I have a, I have it a little bit with them so we will pick up on what's going on in each other's lives and each other's worlds. And I can kind of read some things sometimes, but some people are, are really strong and it's, it's, it can be overwhelming. Hmm. And, and that's, that's actually something I have not talked much about more than just to very few people is how strong that connection can be. Yeah, do, do, do you think it's I, one of the shows you were talking about? And I don't know if it was, it might have been, you might have been talking about this. Was it's almost like a frequency thing. I think you called it a goo. The goo. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Um, I often wonder. So, to explain the goo to any of your listeners that aren't familiar, the goo is all the stuff that's right around you and your body. So it's your electricity, it's your electromagnetic field, it's your pheromones, it's all the things, the parts of you that affect your environment and people that are in your environment. And I think that some people's goo kind of resonates with other people's goo. Right. So they kind of have an attraction like that. So I think there are other and I think those other people that I link more strongly with have a more similar <laughs> goo to mine. <laughs> well, I, I always look at it as like compatible frequencies. Yes, yeah. And I lost my train of thought. <laughs> I know how that goes one. too. Um, the I mean that it's interesting because you're including everything in there and everything does have a factor, but I, I almost feel like we're surrounded by an information field. Yes. And some people can pick up on it and some people can't because it just depends on each individual's frequency. Because I've met people that I don't yeah. pick anything up from. They're like not right. even there. And I'm like, that's kind of freaky. It doesn't happen very often. But, it, you know. Yeah. Here and Voice there. It can it's be like, uncomfortable. Yeah. Yeah. Once, yeah. That's those. I've experienced a void and it's like, I just, you just don't want to be around them. And I, 
for the most part, I'm okay with it. I just assume the frequencies are so incompatible that I'm just not picking it up. Yeah. But I yeah. do, I do like the goo idea. That's, that's a really cool I- way of looking at it. Thank you. Um, and it's something, and I, I think I mentioned before, I think sometimes when enough people who have similar frequencies, their goos are compatible, that they can almost um, affect their environment around them. So more, mm-hmm. they have more experiences around each other because they're kind of on, they all are kind of resonating and they pull that out of the environment. They yeah. amplify the signal. Yeah. Kind of like antennas. Yeah, it's certainly possible. I hadn't really thought about it like that. The other way I think of it, too, is um, some of some of the experiences I've had and some of them that I've had with Kendra have been with m- many other people. And not all of us were on the same frequency. But I think sometimes when you have three or four people who have enough of the goo, for want of a better term... That we almost make an umbrella yeah. of the frequency that picks up whatever is out there that everybody then experiences. We sort of carry people along with us. Um, and that sounds crazy, but it... That makes sense to me. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it's, it does at least explain some of the larger gatherings of people that we've seen and experienced things with. Can, can you give some examples of that? Uh, we're going to do a whole show <laughs> about <laughs> our graduation party. Um, but we, yeah, we can talk about though, were you, uh, you were around for the, the little lights over at Brad and Janet's house, right? For no, some of those? I wasn't. No. So, well, we'll just talk a little bit about it then. Um, so I'll, we were having a party. And uh, there were only 12 people. What? I might have been. Go ahead. Okay. Well, I don't think you were there for the 4th of July when Dave and I no. saw the one up close. No. No. Okay. Not we'll, that we'll, just, one. we'll just talk about the, the beginning of the graduation party. We won't go into the whole thing. Just or the dead finch. Oh, do you, you can talk about that. I, you know, I was dumb, brought it up, and I didn't really want to talk about it. So. <laughs> so. <laughs> We were at one of our many gatherings and I, we were, I remember we were sitting in a big circle and we were focusing on something. You had the ADHD girl telling this story. This is not fair. So we're all sitting in a circle and we're kind of all focusing on something. I forget what it was, but it was, we were trying to calm down because of the, the, the thing outside. We saw, yeah, we saw a thing outside and it was, yeah. And then we we're all trying to calm ourselves down. That's right. But we we're all and then we all kind of one by one were kind of had an uncomfortable feeling kind of wash over us. And you could kind of watch it because you'd feel it and you'd look around and you'd see the next person kind of jar from it and you kind of watched it go go around the circle. And at some point we realized that prior to all this that the little finch in the corner was making this beautiful song. And then the finch just stopped and we went and the poor finch was dead. And we're like, okay, let's not do this ever again. Hmm. Yeah. That was, that was the friends of ours were having a, a problem with negativity in the house and everybody was, was basically being alternately grabbed by dread. It was like, being shaken by something that was just dreadful and it was trying to get a rise out of us. It was trying to make us be afraid. And, you know, my brilliant idea was, you know, breathe, don't be afraid. Don't let it do that to you. But uh, I wasn't that practiced yet. I guess I did not control the situation and the bird who had plenty of food and water just stopped singing yeah, mm. and that was really. I'm just glad we didn't live in that house. Let's just put it that way. Did, did, and I really do think that case was a case of the people living in the house agreed. had issues with each other. Mm. So the negativity didn't stop after that. 
No, no. Well, in that that area, it's right next to a transformer, or not a transformer, um, substation. substation. Oh, so that did not help matters. Yeah, the interplay of all this stuff. I always, I always consider it kind of a web of things. Like it's, it, I don't think mm-hmm. there's one answer to all of it, but there's this web of interconnecting things that affect it all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there was an electrical substation right across the street. It wasn't just nearby. It was like you went out the front door and there it was. Um, And I always knew that was bad news. Um, But that entire section of that part of town has lots of weird energies and people seeing apparitions and all kinds of stuff. Hmm. Can I tell my cool ghost story? Yes, please. So I lived in this house right around the corner from them. It was across the street from the church, and it was right next to this little CB station. And anytime I turn on my stereo, if they would do anything with their CBs, it would just blast through the speakers. Oh. The TV, anything with the speaker, we had to listen to those CBs. Drove us crazy. So I moved in. The first night, I'm like, there's something else living here, and I don't know what it is. And it was strong enough that at one point, I saw someone walk across the living room out of the corner of my eye, and it looked, it reminded me, it was like the build of one of my housemates that hadn't moved in yet. And we kind of spent that school year talking about the ghost. And it would move stuff around like you the keys were never where anybody left them they would end up someplace else but it would always like let you know where they were like you'd go okay where are my keys and you get a little flash of an image and it's like okay they're over on top of this like on top of the fridge under the bread dumb places where nobody's leaving their keys (laughs) right so we had this little wicker wicker chair that no one could ever sit in because it was a broken piece of crap because we were college students and it just looked nice and we kept it there for decoration but you'd hear something plop down on the wicker chair now and again like someone just sitting down and at one point one of my housemates girlfriends came over and she got this look in her face and she came into my, my bedroom was on the first floor in the front of the house and she's like his name's David. He wears an army coat, blue jeans, and um, combat boots. And he's really focused on you. And I'm like, okay, okay, and great. <laughs> so we got through that school year. The following autumn, I took an ill-advised drive across the country with people I didn't know. It was fun. I had a great time. I made some memories. I made some mistakes. But on that trip, one of the guys, the guy that was one of the guys on the trip was talking about this house he lived in in Athens on the same street I lived on in. And there was this little CB shop next door. And I'm like, oh, my God, you lived in the same house. But he lived there in the 60s. And I said, so I got a question. Did you know of any of the guys that lived there? And I described what my friend had told me, the hair color, the stature, the way this guy was. <laughs> and the guy goes, that was my housemate. Oh. And I said, I think your housemate's dead. And he goes, I'm really not surprised. <laughs> <laughs> but that was like the weirdest moment where I'm like, wait, what? And it was odd. And I look back and it, it's odd that it that energy, that that ghost or whatever you want to call it, was focused on me. And a year later, I was with that person's housemate. It's just such an odd little. Yeah. No, that's really interesting. Because you also got to wonder if it's a time slip of sorts. Yep. I do yeah. wonder about that. You know, with with the stuff that happens to you, the, I mean, the stuff moving could be poltergeist activity generated mm-hmm. from you that's corresponding to the time slips you're seeing. That could be. Yeah. And maybe the connection actually came from the future when you met this guy who lived in the same house. Yeah. That could be. And he was actually something else I've never really talked about. He's the first person I really established a link with. Mm. And it was really strange. So I'm, I'm sitting in the car and I'm 
just doodling in a notebook, listening to a song. And in my head, I've got this imagery that's going along with music. And there is very distinctly someone in that moment as I'm thinking about there's it, there's a separate person there with me. And it was really bizarre. Like I could physically feel that presence in in that thought that I was having. And as I looked up for my notebook, this was so creepy. <laughs> he was <laughs> clear he had, uh, was cleaning the windshield and pulled the squeegee across and was looking right in my eyes as he pulled it across and I looked up and I'm like, I am not listening to that song again for a very <laughs> long time. Huh. Yeah. That's again very interesting. Yeah. So, uh, Barbara, do you want to tell some of your experiences? I know you said you had some stuff with lights. Yeah. Um, so these lights are seen around Athens. Um, what I didn't know when I first came here to Athens is that they've been seen here off and on, at least since the 19th century. I've done research since then. And uh, I, I had no idea, and I'd never experienced this kind of thing in the woods before. But it started with our friends Brad and Janet, not their real names, clearly. Um, they called me up one day and said, there's this thing, it's happening at our house, we want you to come over. And I'm like, okay, what's the thing? And they were like, just just come over. So, you know, we got in the car, we went over, and they were looking out their kitchen window down the hill into the dark, into the woods, and it looked like Christmas tree lights, except they were moving. And I was like, uh, what, what are those? And they were like, well, we hoped you'd tell us that. <laughs> and my husband could not see them. He did not see them at all. He was like, I don't see anything. But the three of us saw it. And then it became a, a case of every time we went over there to do anything, we saw them, except my husband. He never saw them. Oh. Did your, and did, then, your, did, your husband, go ahead. did your husband witness other stuff that happened to you, or is it just the lights that he didn't see? Um, well, I was about to say we moved out of town into the house that we call the falling down the hill house because the person who built it did not pour concrete footers for the uh, the foundation. So oh. it was kind of just sitting on sand and uh, it was falling down the hill. So it was kind of a shack, but it came with eight acres of really cool woods, mm. which things lived in. Uh, because pretty much the very first night we lived there, we heard a scream outside and he heard that. I decided it was a, a fox catching a rabbit. That's what I said it was. That's I decided that's what it was. <laughs> it, it may it may have been. I may have just been telling my husband who grew up in the city that that's what that was. But I, you know, he did hear that, and then we start. I started seeing the lights out in the woods, and then we. St I started seeing them in the house. Um, there is a very infamous moment we had this cat she was we called her ether she was white with one blue eye and one yellow eye and she was daft she really was and she used to chase invisible things in our house during the day and we used to tease we used to say she was a ghost cat she wasn't a real cat she was a ghost cat hmm. and uh she would disappear for like hours and hours. And this was a tiny house. We never did figure out where she went. Um, but I, I got up one night to, to go to the bathroom and I opened the bedroom door and there was our cat ether dashing around the living room that was full of these lights. And she was physically chasing them and they were playing with her. Huh. The, they were, you know, flying out of her range. You know, they dip down close and she'd jump up to, to catch and then they'd, you know, pop out of the way. And I'm standing there and the whole path to the bathroom is full of these little lights. And I'm like, oh, Jesus, I got to go pee. You know, <laughs> what am I going to do with this? 
<laughs> and I, so I was just like, finally, I just closed my eyes and I took a deep breath and I just said, y'all, I really need to go to the bathroom. Can you please just give me a path so I can go? You may not have bodies, but I do. And they, they sort of all kind of moved and gave me a clear space that was a straight shot to the bathroom. So I ran and I did my business and I came out. The path was still there and I scooted through, got to my door, of the bedroom door, and they all just started, you know, they filled in the path again. And the cat was just gleefully chasing them around. And I was just like, you know what? I, I don't, I can't. I just went back to bed, shut the door. <laughs> And went to sleep. I was <laughs> like, that's too much. Um, but he never did see them until the last night we lived there. And he saw one. Um, he had other things happen. He heard things. There was the night that we heard horses ride past. Horses and riders go past our window. Our bedroom window. Because it was a single story house. And it was a moonlit night, and um, we ran to the window because I was like, what jackasses are running through <laughs> our yard? What's happening? And you could hear that the thing that got me was it wasn't because you could hear the jingle of the bridles. Both both my husband and I rode horses, and you could hear the squeak of the saddles. Um, and so we looked out, and it's a brilliant moon. We could see nothing. There was nothing out there, but we could still hear them. Um, that was creepy. Yeah, and, uh, you know, we kept looking and we never did see anything out there. The next day I went out and I looked because it was kind of, it was springtime. So it was kind of muddy. And there was like one hoof print I could find, but it was small. It wasn't like, you know, a big horse size. And it was only one. And I was like, okay, whatever. <laughs> it's like that, you know, the the one Bigfoot footprint, yeah. you know, in the middle of a, a big mud puddle, you know, and no other footprints around. It was like that. And and that's exactly what I thought. I just kind of rolled my eyes and was like, okay, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> um, I didn't sleep real well at that house. But the very last night, he did see one. We were about to go to sleep. And he looked up at the ceiling and there was a red little ball of light up there. And he went, hey, hey, hey. And I was like, <laughs> what? And he said, is that one of them? And I said, yep, that, that's one of them. And he was like, it looks like a laser pointer, except there's no beam. Yeah. I went, yep, yep, no beam. So he gets up. And he starts fiddling with the blinds and he's trying to find a beam of light that's casting it. You know, so he's waving his arms like a weirdo, you know, all through the, <laughs> the room, standing on the bed, moving around. And it's it's just sort of dancing around up at the ceiling, kind of like, <laughs> check out what I'm doing to this guy. And he he was like, so you see this all the time? I went, well, not all the time, but a lot of the time. And. Yeah, our whole house was filled with those of different colors. And yeah, I had to go to the bathroom, I, like I told you. And he's like, man, I'm glad we're moving. Did you ever try to take <laughs> pictures of them? Nope. It was before digital cameras. Ah, uh, okay. This was back in the 90s. Hmm. And I was just kind of, I didn't believe that a photograph would come out. Right, right. Um, I wasn't exactly sure that I was really looking at actual light um since i've seen them recently i have held my phone camera up to see if i can see them through the camera yeah and i can see them through the camera and when i have photographed them they do not look the same yeah i've heard other people say that too yeah they're weird what, what do yours look like on camera little points of light okay and when you're seeing them in person they look more like what balls yeah like ping pong ball to like soft orange sized ball, like a navel orange size to like grapefruit sized, huh. depending. Well, grapefruit size, that's pretty big. Yeah, I, I don't want those too close. <laughs> do, do you get a, a sense of like uh, negative energy from them? No, 
No, not really. It's just a case of, well, you're not supposed to be there. (laughs) (laughs) You're not supposed to be seeing that. That's just, and then the one time that I had one come up really, really close, it, I, it wasn't a telepathic in words communication, but it was a very definite communication and I felt it. Mm Mm-hmm. And that whole telepathy thing from a non-human intelligence really freaked me out. What, what impression did you get? Um, okay, so this is this one I don't like to tell. I've told it now, like, several times, and, and people have heard it, because it's one of those stories that's self-negating because it's just so ridiculous. And it's so... It's just one of those things that... It, as my father said, if I had ever seen that, I would never tell anybody. But here I am, and so I'm going to tell people again. Um, my friend Dave and I, Dave's passed, so I can I can say his name. We had been hanging out at uh, Brad and Janet's place. It was the 4th of July, and everybody was playing with sparklers out in the front yard. And neither... Neither Dave or I liked um, fireworks or anything like that. So we were sitting on the back deck that overlooked the woods where the lights are. And the lights were out. And Dave said, you should sing to them. And so I did. And they started coming closer. And he said, you should keep singing. And I wasn't so sure about that. But, you know, (laughs) I was young and stupid. So I, I kept singing. And they kept coming closer and closer, and they would they would turn on and turn off. So they would blink like fireflies, but they weren't the right colors because yeah. fireflies aren't orange or red <laughs> right. or sort of a peachy pink color or blue or any of that. And they're coming closer and closer. And I'm starting to my throat is starting to close up because they're getting really, really close. And I was like, Dave, and he's like, no, just keep singing. And I'm like, okay. So I kept singing and one orange one comes close. And it's like, I want to say about seven feet from us and it flashes brightly. When it flashed brightly, it seemed to have a white moth inside of it that was, it looked solid. And it, it was an orange moth, but what it really looked like was that it was a white moth that had the orange light bathing it so that it, it glowed orange. And at that point, my voice started to squeak, and I was like, uh, and. Dave didn't tell me to keep singing, so my, my voice just kind of started to fade out and go, no, no, I'm not going to do this anymore. And it, it blinked off. It was on for a few seconds, and it blinked off. And when it blinked off, it looked like it disappeared. And I was like, whew, yeah, okay. And then it got within about five feet of us right in front of our faces, and it blinked on. And for a second, it looked like a little naked lady with moth wings and Mm. long hair. And it was at that point that I got the communication and it was specifically directed at me and it was directed at something I said three days before. Because we used to own a pagan bookstore downtown and we had discussion groups every week. And one week, somebody had asked me to do a presentation about fairy lore, which I know a lot about. And I had said, okay, we'll do that. So I had done that. And one of the final things I said was, because people were all like, oh, I wish I could see see fairies. I wish I could see the good folk. I want to I want to see what you see. And I was like, no, not necessarily. I don't know that you do. You have to understand these aren't little, cute, pretty, sweet things. These are ancient, powerful beings. They don't look like Tinkerbell. Right. That was exactly what I said. So when that image flashed in front of me and she looked as solid as could be, 
Like, I could have reached out and touched her, which I would never have done, but I could have. The f- I didn't hear it in words, but the feeling that I got in my head was very specific. It was, we can look however we want. Yeah. We can shape however we want. And you don't know as much as you think you know. <laughs> and then it turned out and then turned back on and it was just a light and it zoomed off into the woods. Now, while all this was going on, Dave had a hold of my wrist and he's a guitarist. So he had really strong hands, even though he was a little skinny creature. Mm-hmm. And he had a hold of my wrist and he nearly dislocated it. He was holding on so tight. And I looked at him, and he looked at me, and he said, did you see that? And I said, no, and neither did you. And I grabbed him (laughs) back, and we ran through the house out to the front yard and came out the front door just panting like we had just run a marathon, terrified. And everybody's like, whoa, what's up? You okay? (laughs) And we were like, no. (laughs) But we didn't talk about it for a year. It was kind of like Kendra with what she saw but it didn't last as long for us so but we didn't talk about it i I did tell zach but he was kind of like well eh, eh, no wonder you looked so scared so it reached (laughs) into your head oh that's well i'm glad that's not me (laughs) pops is helpful like that sometimes (laughs) I had had, uh, after the, the la- I think it was the last time the Ghost Hunters TV show did a live Halloween thing where Grant was very obviously faking some of the stuff. Um, th- there was a thing he had, like a voice trigger. He'd walk past the doorway and you'd hear what sounded like a tape recorder play, it, play uh, this repeated thing. Like every time he walked past the doorway, it would do it. And it's just like, yeah, okay, sure. And I had written a blog post about it and I'm, I go to bed and I wake up at some point and I hear that exact s- s- type of voice come out of my closet and say something ridiculous. Oh, nah, and, it, awesome. and it said it three times in a row. And I just oh. kind of looked at it and went, okay, I get it. You can sound like whatever you want. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> so I didn't get the message in my head, but that's how I took that. Like I'm hearing the hearing it in the same tinny yep. recorder thing. It's like that's not absolute proof it was fake. I'm, I'm sure Grant, Grant was faking it because it was other stuff that night too. But like, just the sound of it isn't enough. Like, what's it supposed to sound like? It could sound like whatever it wants. Yep, that's exactly it. See, we I I had I've had multiple light experiences, but the only one that comes close to what you experienced was walking through the graveyard with my girlfriend and a friend of ours that turned out to be a narcissist. And my girlfriend and I both connected really well with this stuff, and we were just swarmed, almost like being swarmed by insects, except they were just tiny points of light, little globes of light yeah. swarming all around us. And she looks at me and she's like, "Are you seeing this?" And I'm like, "Uh huh." And we looked at him and went, are you seeing this? And he's like, seeing what? And we're yeah. like, the lights? He's like, what lights? And we're like, huh. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> that is that is interesting. And I've seen other lights in that graveyard. Like, if you sit for long enough, you'll usually see the occasional light wander through the graves. Especially where the creek runs through it. So, I mean, I think that's one of the factors that sometimes energizes these places. Is running yeah. water. Yep. Oh yeah. There was a spring up the hill in the woods at the falling down the hill house. That's why it was all that it was so marshy the last time we were out there, Kendra. Yeah. And and it almost like you know when you talk about the falling down the hill house, it almost makes it a liminal place because it's always moving. Yeah, it was <laughs> liminal. It was a weird, weird little place. Yeah. Um, Morgana, do you want to share any of your experiences? Sure. Um, so I've, I've had a couple, I think I could classify my experiences as ghosts because my grandmother's house was haunted and it was very haunted. It was a pre-civil war and they actually used the basement 
as a makeshift field hospital at one point. Um, I would not set foot in that basement further than where the washer and dryers were because it was dug into sandstone. So it, it turned into caves. Wow. Bad vibes. Bad vibes. Yeah. yeah. Um, but there was a woman that I saw. I saw the top half of her, and she was a middle-aged, going into elderly woman, and she was on the servant's stairs that went all the way up from the attic to the kitchen, and I was messing around in the attics when I was about, I want to say 10 or 11 and I was going down the stairs because I had never discovered the servant stairs until now. And so I started going down the stairs and I came to the bend and I went around the bend and there was this woman and she looked, now that I'm older, I can identify her clothes as they, she looked kind of like the 1930s. Okay. Like just a normal like blouse that was buttoned up and like, high necked but not like super high necked like the Edwardian era or anything like that she just looked like a normal lady mm-hmm. um, but it was only the top half of her and she was misty and I looked and I blinked and I remembered you know my whole family my dad and my grand, his mother my grandmother and my uncle Wayne had talked about no the, the house has ghosts in it so I didn't fully panic but I sure ran really fast <laughs> And I was like, because I, I couldn't run past her to get to the kitchen door. So I ran upstairs through the whole attic and back down and around. <laughs> um, and that was the same house that I never saw the young gentleman. Um, there was a young man who would appear in one of the bedrooms in front of the mirror um, that everybody else saw. I never saw that one. Hmm. Um, I did see... So what, some of the things I see are either very obviously there or they are sort of, they look like heat shimmer, but with colors in it that hmm. forms shapes. Um, like geometric shapes or just like li- things okay. like images, like creatures, people hang on. Stop it. Um, creatures or people or currents in the air almost, except they're not like over a road or over where something would be hot. They just look like flows of energy and so- sometimes they have different colors in them. Huh. Um, and I've seen those since I was a small child. Um, but one of those, a very big one of those, a huge swirling mass of that would come out of the mirror at the end of the upstairs hallway. And this was a really old mirror, like old enough it had a silver back, not one of the modern ones. And so it was creepy and splotchy because it was so old that the silver was falling away and it was a floor length mirror. And this huge well of energy would boil out of it and chase me. Hmm. And I had to get all the way down to the first landing of the stairs, and then it couldn't follow me past the sunlight that the wind that the stained glass window cast. I don't know why. Um, but that was so that's one kind of thing, and I don't know if that was a ghost. I don't know if that was just my grandmother was a very odd woman, and there was a lot of interpersonal conflict in that house. I don't know what that was. I don't like mirrors to this day because of it, though. Understandable. Mirrors are creepy anyway. (laughs) Just they're not found in nature. Like the (laughs) best we get is the reflection in a pool or a highly polished piece of obsidian or like some metal. Like we're not supposed to have really, really good, perfect mirrors. They're creepy. No, (laughs) I am very (laughs) anti-mirror. So I take it you've never tried to make one of those mirror boxes that's all mirrors? No, psychomantium. Yeah. I have never tried a psychomantium. <laughs> I think they would be fascinating and they probably would work. But I also have a sneaking suspicion that a Lovecraftian horror will snatch me. <laughs> that just makes me want to make one more. I, I know. totally get that. I do. And if, if like, I, I go through periods where, like, I am a lot more reckless and devil may care. And then I go through extremely cautious, mm. if not cowardly periods. And, you know, I don't know if it's cowardice 
if you're like, yeah, no, that's that, that, a terrible that, that's plan. That's not cowardice. That's just caution. That's right. It's common sense at this point. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm, um, I'm the one who always runs at the at the scary things. Yeah, I, I want to learn more that's about what them. Mom does, and I don't know. That's always the best best thing to do. It's it's just the I, reaction yes. I have. I totally yeah. get that because I understand I, that. I did break into the haunted tuberculosis ward, you know, mm. when I was a teenager. Um, is that is that where you, where you had things things on either side of you? Yeah, when yes. when you had the the nurse. Yes, you saw the nurse. And we saw Brittany. the nurse, and we saw the doctor, and then we hit a certain point, and it told us to go. Really. And we were like, okay, time to go. And me and my best friend turned and I grabbed my boyfriend who, my boyfriend at the time, who never Should've saw left. anything. Huh. Should have left. He was, he was one of those people that it just is like a blockhead. Like not, in, not like he was dumb, but like he just didn't have any sensitivity whatsoever. Um, and both me and my best friend got... It was like somebody shouted in our heads and put their like shoved both of our chests at the same time and was like, leave. And we were like, OK, don't huh. have to tell us twice, man. Sorry. Um, and that's that's mostly the ghostly experiences. I have seen a few UFOs, um, some big ones, some just smaller lights in the sky. And you took that picture. And I did take a picture of the... I only got one of the red ones that I saw um, in that picture. Doesn't prove a thing. Uh, it's it still doesn't. pretty cool. <laughs> it is cool. I did manage to take a picture of an unidentified flying object in the sky. <laughs> and that's um, the thing. Pictures are never going to prove it, but... No. You know, but they are kind of cool to have. Exactly. And that's sort of how I feel about it. Um, there were... I was walking the dog... And I got barely out of my driveway and I looked up and low in the sky, there were two prismatic glowing red blobs that were really low in the sky. You know, I've got high tension wires right by my house. Um, and these looked to be barely above those. So, maybe 90 feet in the air. Hmm. Um, and I was like, oh my God, because I kept seeing things. This was like the year I saw UFOs. And I never had my phone on me and never thought to take pictures when I did have my phone on me. So I <laughs> ran back to the house and I grabbed my phone. My dog had no idea what's going on. He's like, I thought it was time to pee. Why is mom like suddenly looking up at the sky and being super excited? And now we're going back in the house and she's not taking me back out with her. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I got, I managed to get underneath them and get my phone pointed up. And then one, one of the two, the one on the lower left just flickered and then what faded and went out. Like it went, it like sucked into a point and then the point disappeared. Right. Mm -hmm. And then I managed to get two pictures of the other one before it did that too. It, it does. And then I, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, that's all right. It doesn't sound completely different from what John Keel described when he was in, in the Mothman area where they would see the, the sort of globs of color and he would shine the yeah. flashlight at them. It was sort of like that, except they weren't purple and I didn't have a flashlight. Right. Um, but they they were not they were just little and they were small these were not big globes of light these were they looked in the sky they looked like they were maybe i don't know i want to say the size of like a beach ball maybe but you know 100 feet up so small looking yeah um and then the biggest one I saw was me and, again, me and my best friend, we both saw it at the same time. Um, and she, I had been at work and I didn't drive at that point. I rode my bike and she says that she heard me come home and get my bike on the porch. So she goes out to meet me and she looks up in the sky and she sees 
these three golden orange glowing discs, disc circles, mm. like spheres that were just in this little arc, this perfect arc, like equidistant from each other and big. Like they were the size of the moon in the sky, but it was daylight. And I'm just now biking up the street. So she did not hear me get there. So I see her on the porch and I'm like, what are you looking at? And she says, look up. And I'm, I straddle my bike and I look up and we're both just staring at these things. And they're just gently floating in this arc. And then one by one, it was like they went behind a door or something. You know, when somebody passes along a hallway and there's the corner and you watch them disappear around yeah. the corner. It was like that, except there was nothing for them to disappear behind. They just hit a line in the sky, and it was like they went behind this line, and then they were just gone one after the other. Wow, that's really interesting. And, it, and it's broad daylight. Yeah. It's like three in the afternoon. We're on a reasonably busy intersection. There's no cars. There's nothing. It's completely dead silent while we're watching this. And then we both forgot about it. Hmm. Like we we went in the house, we forgot about it for three hours. All of a sudden, we both remembered at the same time, and we're like, "Oh my god!" And we were like, "We have to tell mom." And then we forgot again for three days. And <laughs> it was only after like I told mom finally that like we quit forgetting about it constantly. Yeah. Um. And, and why 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 do you think that people forget these things? Because that's not uncommon. I think that I think there's probably a couple reasons. I think as paranoid as it sounds, I think sometimes whatever it is doesn't want us to remember. Mm. Um, I think sometimes we don't want to remember. Yeah. Because it's something just doesn't fit into reality. So we just dismiss it. Or our brain does it for us. Exactly. Or our brain is just like, no, I'm not handling this today. <laughs> That's error correction. I'm just going to get rid of that. Yeah, yeah, no, that's exactly like you filter that out. That's just noise or static or something. I, I also wonder because uh, it, it almost feels like the same way that you can forget and remember a dream over and over until you like write it down or yes, tell somebody about exactly. it. Exactly. And it's weird because that is the one supernatural or paranormal or whatever you, weird thing that's happened to me that I've con I consistently forgot about. Huh. I've remembered everything else. It was just that one thing. Well, you've remembered everything you know you were. That's true. <laughs> I might have forgotten so many things, and that's entirely possible. And like, ooh. <laughs> Thanks for that. Thanks no for that, problem. Soraya. <laughs> I will also be sitting up at night going, what did I forget? <laughs> no, I won't. I will live in blissful ignorance. <laughs> so the, the experience with uh, your, your friend hearing you come home is actually called a Vardoger. Really? Yes, it is. I forget where it's at. Maybe from Sweden or something that the term originates, but it's hearing uh, exactly like that. Hearing someone come home shortly before they actually do or hearing familiar noises very distinctly before they actually happen. That's awesome. Oh. That would be useful, occasionally possibly useful. Yeah, um, yeah. If you knew it was happening. Yeah. If you didn't know, it would just be like, ah. Uh. <laughs> it's just normal because i mean people uh, people have told me about these experiences it, it tends to be like you know oh they thought so and so came home like they thought their their friend came home and then eventually they go out into the other room like 10 minutes later and then their friend comes home and they're like what weren't you home right. already <laughs> right i also some i sometimes feel like that happened because i wonder if she hadn't come outside if I would have noticed it because they would have been behind right. me as I was riding home. Oh yeah. It certainly could have been something to draw your attention to it. I don't think this stuff is, is accidental. No, I don't either. And even um, the that's the most, Oh, sorry. I keep interrupting. No, no, you're fine. Go Just ahead. shout me down. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to do that. Go ahead. That's the most impressive UFO one. Um, Everything else falls into this fuzzy category of fairy experiences slash spirits. Mm. Um, I think the the scariest one, and you're going to be the first one I've actually told this to besides, I think, Mom and Kendra, um, because I've been waiting for a good time to tell it. So 
I I remember the falling down the hill house incidentally. I've I've had some what I consider my normal fairy experiences, which is experiences with little lights. Um, I think I think of those as as fairy lights pretty much. I know I'm not supposed to like categorize it, but if it looks like a duck, it's a duck. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, and you, you can identify it as that without being so held to that belief that you, you can't oh, see yeah. the it, too. I mean, sometimes it's just convenience. <laughs> I, yeah, oh, and it's, it is convenient. Um, and I do see those still to this day, not as frequently some years as others. But, you know, I saw them when I was a kid. Um, Misha, my mom's other cat, um, who was big and gray and hated me. 24 seven, except when I would get put to bed at the falling down the hill house and then she would sleep on my bed huh. and she would sleep on my bed because the little lights would try and come in the room and she would scare them off. Um, huh. And so I have a very distinct memory of being like four, three or four. Um, and you know how early childhood memories are really fuzzy around yeah. the edges of whatever the image is. Certainly. But I have this really distinct image of Misha standing with her back arched and her ears back hissing with her tail lashing at the window. And there being purple, glow, little purple, like fist-sized glowing lights dancing right outside the glass. Was this the yeah. same cat that was chasing them in the other room? No. Okay. This was not Ether. Okay. All right. Misha didn't like them. She Ether did. <laughs> Ether was not Ether was not entirely of this world. I am convinced that she <laughs> would like she was only partially in this world. I love that cat. <laughs> um, so your experience at the hospital when you said you felt like that sudden urge to leave. I've had experiences uh, not not where I felt like something wanted me to leave, but almost like the energy exhausted itself. Like the show is over, you can go now. Yeah, I can totally see that too. Um, I've had a sudden cessation. Like it, I've had, I've felt like a buildup of something, and then something happens, and then it goes dead. Yeah, yeah. Um, this was this was more like be gone. Hmm. <laughs> this is not your place. It's time for you to leave now. And I was not going to argue with that. <laughs> right. Um, See, especially still... not when somebody else has the same feeling. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I do kind of wonder though, if it was a time slip and the nurse saw you and I was just like, too. Uh, uh, get out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, yeah. Cause I mean, you're not supposed to be here. We really you know, weren't. No, no visitors, you know, it wouldn't Could've surprise been. me. Like maybe it was the hospital administrator from forty years ago, <laughs> right? Who was like, "Excuse me, why are there teenagers running the halls of this institution?" <laughs> um, what? Uh, I've, I've, oh. Go ahead. Um, no, you go ahead. Which 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 one of you uh, had the experience with the moon? That was me Can with you, the moon splitting. Seeming to split into yeah. four separate moons. And, you know, at the time, I didn't think of it as a UFO thing. I don't, I can't explain that. But um, that was with Morgana's father when we were in high school and my best friend. And we had been together doing astral projection type stuff with a bunch of friends of ours because we were very, very strange, nerdy children um, who, you know, were interested in the occult. And they were dropping me off at home. And they parked the car. He parked his car, like, a street over because there was no parking on my street. It was all parked up. And so we were, we got out of the car and they were walking me to the door and I glanced up and it was a full moon and I looked at it and it was just amazingly beautiful, but then it started to wobble and I was like, Oh, something's wrong with my eyes. And then it, it looked like it got bigger and I said, Hey, uh, look at the, look at the moon. 
And my best friend went, oh, my God. So I realized it wasn't my eyes, but it, it wobbled and sort of looked like it got expanded. And then out of its side sort of shot another moon is what it looked like. And then another one did the same thing. And then a, a third one. And so there were four of them, one in each quadrant of the sky. And uh, Morgana's father was kind of like, what? oh, my God. And we're standing in the middle of the street, a city street, you know, Charleston, West Virginia. I mean, it's it's not super urban, but it's as close to urban as West Virginia gets. So, you know, we really shouldn't have been standing in the middle of the street. So, yeah, we moved to the sidewalk, but we're still standing there gaping at it. And we were all like, what is that? And um, <laughs> my best friend was like, did we go back in our bodies all the way or did we like screw up something what <laughs> you know we were like oh no and then it 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 just gradually they this started moving back together and sort of sucked back into the moon and then i had to walk home and you know my mom was mad at us for being late you know normal high school student things you know, she thought we'd been drinking. We'd been doing much worse. We'd been doing occult things. <laughs> uh, so, so, were you out drinking? Mm, no. No, we no. were out witching. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing. You know, you look funny. Why do you look funny? <laughs> the moon did yeah, uh, you know, nothing, nothing. The moon's really pretty. We we just were standing, staring at the moon, which she actually believed because we were just that kind of nerdy kids, you know, weird kids. Well, well, <laughs> so. One of the weirdest experiences I ever had revolved around the moon, which is where the moon looked like it kind of fell forwards and started vibrating. It didn't break into pieces like what you saw. But I was in a perfectly normal state of mind. I had walked out back of my property and uh, first, there were like flashes of light, like someone was taking a picture. Ah. And there was a light in the field behind my house that was very dim, but very noticeable that would, would blink on and off for so many seconds. And if I looked at it, it wouldn't blink back on until I looked away. Uh -huh. And then I looked up at the moon, and it was a full moon. And it just, initially, it was, the, the clouds were starting to move in, but the moon would, it kind of like came towards me and just started vibrating. And I'm going, well, that's an optical illusion. And I looked away and I looked back and the moon looked normal. And then it did it again. And I'm going, what the hell? And then as the clouds started to cover it, I thought, okay, now it's getting covered with clouds. It's not going to do that. And I'd look back up and it would pop through the clouds and start shaking again. Oh man. And I was out there and that was one of those instances where I was out there for a long time. And eventually I just felt like, okay, whatever this is, is done. I can go back in now. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. You know, sometimes I just look out my, my back window and there's, you know, I, I, about three weeks ago, I looked out, it was, the moon was really pretty and I looked up and I saw a flash of light and I'm like, oh, it's the first lightning bug. It's the first firefly. Yay. It's a little early. Oh, it's pink. <laughs> uh, it's not a firefly. Okay. And I just close the curtains and just walk away. It's like they're up to their business, whatever. I don't need to know about it. You, you just got to go back to bed. You just got to get them on the podcast. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, at this point, <laughs> at least yours aren't like eyeballs that float over your bed. Because I've, I've had eyeballs that float over my bed recently. Yeah, well, really? Yeah. Glowing rectangular yellow eyes with slit pupils like when, when was, you're do you wake up to this or no i was awake i was awake and reading my kindle and i went to get a drink i pulled my blankets off my head to get a drink of water and i caught light out of the corner of my eye and i turned full around and there's floating a couple inches above my face are these huge rectangular glowing eyes at three in the morning and I just kind of shook my head and went, nope. And pulled the blanket over my head and went back to reading on my Kindle because what else are you going to do at that point? Again, in invited on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Did we have the podcast then? It was right before we started oh, it. Okay. okay. 
Then I promise if I right see them again, I will invite them on the podcast. Yeah, but the hat man you are not inviting. No, so the sorry. hat man I'm not inviting yeah, the hat yeah, man. You had a hat man um, experience? My boyfriends used to have night terrors. Um, and actually, the first apartment, when we first started running around together, the first apartment he lived in, we ended up moving the bed from the bedroom into the living room. Because we both were getting night such terrible night terrors in there. Um, you know, he would wake up screaming. He shoved me out of bed a few times because wow. he thought I was like one of the vampires from The Strain. Oh. Um, because that's the image he would see um, when he'd have sleep paralysis. Because of I swear there was something wrong with this room. Um, and then I started having sleep paralysis. Um which I had a case, I've had off and on, but it, this was like consistent. It, um, it is suggestive that sleep paralysis is uh, actually catching. I would not be surprised if it is. That would make sense because one of the benefits connection just happened in my head. One of the uh, benefits of co-sleeping, you can buy a little thing, a little sidecar for your bed. So your baby's not actually up against you but one of the benefits of that is you regulate your baby's sleeping with mm. your own breath so yeah. i could see where that would be a similar kind of thing possibly or it's, or it's energy yeah or a combination of both right yeah. there, there's a really good documentary called I, I think it's just called the nightmare i think we did like a two or th we did like maybe a five-part series on a uh, night on on sleep paralysis and, and stuff like that. But we started with that documentary and there were a couple cases where people were like, I never had sleep paralysis until I started, you know, dating this person. And then mm. I started sleeping next to them and suddenly I'm experiencing sleep paralysis. It might be the goo. Yeah. Well, I, that's, I, yeah. I can yeah. definitely see that. Um, and I think it probably made it worse because both of us had it as kids. Mm. Um, and the only thing was, was it, it did stop once we moved the bed to the living room. After, after I saw the, the man, the black hat man, um, who was a pretty, he looked kind of like the Baba Duke, which I can't get through that movie more. I can't get through that movie again <laughs> because it's such a good movie and it it's is. so creepy. But then yeah. once you have a night terror sleep paralysis incident with something that looks kind of like that and it shoots out dagger fingers at you. Huh. Like, because just an all black being with a wide brimmed black hat, like towering about nine feet tall at the end of the bed and you can't move and it reaches its hands up like, you know. Frankenstein, honestly, how he would do the hands in the old movies, but then the fingers shot out, like, and elongated. Yeah, that's like, bad. And that was around that point. I was like, okay, no, because I'm scared if I watch it again, I'll summon that thing back. Mm. Yeah, that's bad. Yeah, and I'm no. good not doing that. <laughs> uh, there's also a lot of electrical stuff going on with <laughs> sleep paralysis. Yep. You know, a lot. Absolutely. I've, I've been told so many cases where people are like, yeah, there was all this electrical stuff going on during the sleep paralysis and stuff. And so it's like, again, electricity plays a part in all of this. There's, a, me. there's a story from when I was in Maryland. I lived in Maryland right before 9-11. So around that time period. Um, and it's one of the few times... I've ever had a an experience with anything I can call definitively like the grays. Mm. Like I have only had like this experience and one other that I can definitively say that looked and acted like a classical gray. Other ones it's kind of in that <laughs> gray area, haha. <laughs> um where you know you it's kind of like that but maybe not but sort of but not really well this thing i had been having weird stuff happen in that house um we lived in columbia maryland which was right between baltimore and washington and we were within a few miles of the nsa headquarters we were within a few miles 
of many other intelligence headquarters. We weren't that far from Goddard Space Center. It was weird. And the place where Zach and I both worked, lots of the people who worked there also worked for the intelligence services. And and the job that they had where we worked was sort of the cover job. Mm. And everybody there knew that, you know, and, and lots of them were like, oh, yeah, we're retired. Wink, wink. Right. Nudge. And so it was just a little surreal working there anyway. And so my general paranoia was already sort of on the, the upper end of paranoia. Sure. But I had gone to sleep that night and nothing was out of the ordinary. But we had a, a stereo in our, in our bedroom because we would listen to CDs to go to sleep. And we had it set so that it would turn itself off after the CD played. Mm. Um, Well, it turned itself on in the middle of the night. There was the sound of voices. There was a crackle of static and there was a light in the room. There were three figures and a voice came out of the stereo that said, she's awake. Let's go. Uh I came out of that bed screaming <laughs> As so <you> should. <laughs> loud and was across the room looking for those little, you know, because I saw them as a silhouette, but right. they were the, you know, the right size, shape, everything. And, you know, until then, I had basically treated the grays as kind of a, not a joke, but a very kitschy, campy kind of Area sure. 51 kind of thing. And no. That was not kitschy. That was not campy. And that st- the radio was still on. Huh. And it was just pouring out static. And there were just these garbled voices coming out of it. I was across the room trying to turn that thing off. I <laughs> It would not turn off for me. Zach jumped up out of bed. was like, what's wrong? I'm like, they were here. They were here. They were here. He's like, oh, boy. Here we go. <laughs> So he he went over, he unplugged it. Um, Luckily, it did stop. I think if it hadn't stopped after he'd unplugged it, I'd have thrown it out the window (laughs) or set it on fire or taken a sledgehammer to it. Very reasonable. Um, Yeah. Um, and, And then, you know, I just paced around the room and finally laid back down, but I wouldn't sleep without the lights for a couple of nights. It was, that was, that was horrible. And I hated it. And we put the thing on the curb the next morning because that (laughs) wasn't the only time it had acted up and done something weird. So I was like, Nope, it's possessed. It can go. (laughs) I can't believe you horror movie. just left it on the curb. Some poor person. Oh, he was at home. (laughs) He wasn't a poor person. He, he came down, he saw it on the curb, and I think he was one of the people who was going through the mail and, like, stealing mail from oh. the neighborhood. So he's kind of a creep anyway. And he's like, <laughs> whoa, why are you, like, getting rid of this? And I'm like, well, you want to know? He said, yeah. I said, it's possessed. I said, it turns itself on in the middle of the night. And he's like, well, but does it play CDs? <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> But the radio turns on and voices come out. Well, yeah, it's the radio. <laughs> you want it? Yeah, you, you just getting okay. rid of it? Yeah, That's sure. That's fair. Okay. I'm like, yeah, whatever. Have fun. Uh, on have his fun head it be then. Yeah, I was like, have fun with that. Hope the grays don't hurt you too far <laughs> away. Whatever. <laughs> you just. What? You, know, you just get on with yourself, man. Whatever the grays are, I mean, you figure you find them in shamanic imagery, you find them in cave paintings, which is probably from ancient shamans, you find them in DMT trips, in ayahuasca yep. visitations, in, in you know, not, it's it's hard at this point to sort out what, how many people have seen grays of that word hypnotized. Because hypnosis is yeah. not a memory recovery yes. tool. So how much of that is just our brains going to, well, we got to create a reality to answer these questions. Or yeah. being in an altered state itself where we have access to whatever these things are. Yeah. So having them physically I, in your room like that in such a visceral way with it turning on the radio and stuff is impressive. I didn't like it. It could be <laughs> impressive at that other guy's house. I, 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 I don't, I don't I know what happened it. to him either, right? <laughs> 
Zero yeah. out of ten. Would not recommend. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yes, if I had bought that on Amazon, that's that's what it, <laughs> this thing turns itself on for no reason. <laughs> and summons aliens. Summons the aliens. I'm pretty sure you could could have sold that for a lot of money with that description. So probably. 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 I mean, I didn't on. care. The the ghost in the jar sold, you know, a couple decades ago. <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> I right. remember that so much. <laughs> we are almost I love that. We're almost out of time. Can you all stick around for a Patreon segment? Sure. Sure. Okay. Uh you have about twenty seven episodes up. What what if someone was gonna pick one to start with, what would it be? What's been your favorite mm-hmm. so far? Huh. I think if you want a deep, if you want something that's Athensy and weird, start with the Ridges episodes. Um, if you want a fun discussion, though, Josh Cutchin. Mm. We have two episodes with Josh, and the one with Greg Bishop is is pretty awesome too. That one was three hours long until <laughs> I edited it down to an hour and a half. Greg is awesome. Oh yeah, yeah. Greg, Greg's a regular on here. Josh is very much a re- <laughs> Josh. Josh and Tim are like co-hosts, pretty much, along with Red Pill and a few others. Yeah. First time I heard Josh on uh, the Grelian Report, I was like, I need to talk to this guy. <laughs> oh yeah, uh, I the first first of his books I read, I was like, this guy's brilliant. Yeah, yeah, and I had only been studying it a few years. Yeah, I know, right. <laughs> uh, so where and people can find the podcast where? Uh six degrees of John dot com. It's the numeral six and then the rest of it spelled out. Um we're also on Stitcher, Spotify, and Apple. Uh let's see, we're also on Facebook. You can find us by just typing in six degrees of John Keel and, and you'll find our, our little homepage. We have a blog on our website as well. Oh, okay. And uh, eventually we're going to put up a bunch of stuff like book suggestions. But if you look at the show notes, because lots of the guests on our show read like a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. So I put all the suggestions that they talk about in the show. And with Greg, it was over 50 books. (laughs) Um, I list them all in the show notes. So that's impressive. I'm probably going to turn that into like, you know, the six degrees suggested reading list from all the guests, you know, I don't know, but yeah, that's a cool idea. Yeah, it's fun. All right. Well, I thank all three of you for being on with me tonight. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you for, for having, having us. us. And I want to take a moment here to thank all of my Patreons. Seriously. You people are the lifeblood of this show. And I want to give a special shout out to those pledging $10 or more. Allison cook. Super Inframan, Eric Hervin, Tim, The Hundredth Monkey Project, Ad Noctum, Patricia Gaiaquinta, Alex Whitcomb, Alfred Tuttle, American Rambler, Andy McNamara, Barbara Fisher, Beverly Williamson, Big Boy Limina, Charles Davis, Chris Ernst, Craig Parmenter, David Moore, Denise Sarek, Dominic O'Malley, Edu Camahort, MTK, Eric Citron, J. Otto Bullet, John Bracken, Eric Todd, James Lattimore, Puck Brother, Joanna Rojas, Jose A., Carla Mahoney, Kevin, Kristen L., Kevin Schreck, Linz Jackson K., Luke Osborne, Jim and Sophie, Mark Bowley, Mark Brady, Matthew Sproul, Maddie, Nagatha Christie, Patricia W., Ray Benedetto, Riker and Stark, Roger Gonzalez, Sam Sheeran, Sedgder, Stone Wilderness, Tactical Therapist, Taylor, 36 Dingo, Vincent Trewell, Walker, Will Powell, William Lovelace, and Ren Collier. Thank you all so very much. I hope everyone enjoyed that. Mm, go check out their podcast, Six Degrees of John Keel. And there is a lengthy Patreon segment as well, as usual. If you want to become a patron, wheredidtheroadgo.com is the place to go. And it's only $3 a month, and it helps us immensely. You can also buy merch and other stuff off the website, or just make a donation if you'd rather do that. And thank you to everyone who has done that. And I'll see you next time.
You have been listening to Where Did the Road Go? This show is made possible in part from our Patreons, and we thank you and everyone listening for helping us continue this exploration of the strange. You can always find everything Where Did the Road Go related at www.wheredidtheroadgo.com. And thank you so much for your support.